Uh, this is a, uh, we are headed to the barn here a little bit on this uh, curriculum cycle, and so we continue to push through the summer and appreciate you guys being consistent and because and, um, uh, uh, um, prodigals just never sleep, right? So we're, uh, we got to keep going through the holidays and the summer and everything like that. So I'll just uh, uh, tell you a story just in my own words, just to quickly summarize. I took off uh, about 10 or 15 slides, and I still think I'm going to run over tonight because it's just such a powerful uh, lesson. So let me get started. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, the story I tell that has been powerful, and I discovered in leaders meeting tonight that it's a little bit misunderstood and, um, and uh, could be troubling to, to newcomers. So I'm going to tell you the story anyway because it's probably one of the most powerful stories and the most feedback stories that I've gotten since I've, I've told since I've been here. And that was the one that was actually written in the Watermark News. And, and uh, it came at a point when uh, my son and I um, uh, were escalating our, our, uh, um, our issues and he was uh, going to a, a bad place. And, and it, uh, um, it was like Steve just said, uh, a perfect setup. These words came out of my mouth without me really, it was like somebody else was saying them. But when my son uh, uh, threatened suicide, and, and uh, what I wanted to say was, is that doesn't mean that you should go out and tell your children this or your prodigals this tonight. This was after a long history of manipulation, a long history of lies, a long history of on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And when that happened, he finally he threatened a suicide. I'm glad he didn't do it early because I'd had enough training and, and uh, enough uh, information gathering that, um, that I, had, I had that basis, but I also had the Holy Spirit, like Steve said. And at that point, it came to me very clearly, um, and I just said, look, I, son, I uh, um, hope that uh, that doesn't happen. If, if, you, if you do... If that, if, I can't stop you from doing that. You're in your 20s. I, 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 could, I could do a few things, but, it, but if, if you're destined to do that, I can't stop you. And it'll change my life forever. Uh, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. But if you do do that, um, I will never be the same. I will be sad, uh, uh, and I will miss you desperately, but uh, I'm going on. And, and I'm not, you're not going to rob me of my joy. Uh, that's not, I find my joy in God, and I've got to lead myself well, your mom well, uh, your sister well, my community, my practice. I've got to go on, and I just, I, I don't know what to tell you. And, uh, and at that moment, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, you may discuss that in your group, and, and we may, I may emphasize that as we go on tonight, but that was my point of laying Isaac down. And um, that was a story that was in the Watermark News in February of 2010, the first week we rolled out um, the ministry. And in that ministry, Hunter said that, my son said that, um, that uh, you know, we are, you know, the jig was up. In other words, that was, that was my best salvo. That was, that's all I had. And I realized that uh, uh, I wasn't going to be able to, to pull that anymore. And I've seen some suicides here. I, I, I really was of no, I couldn't be sure. Uh, you know, he gave me a ram in the thicket that, that day because, uh, he, because uh, he didn't do what he said he was going to do. And I know that's not true for all of you. It's not true in the history of our ministry. But the point was is that it, it, did, help, it did help our relationship to, to minimize that kind of manipulation going forward. He's never said that again. But it also helped me. I mean, it, in that moment, almost speaking out of body, um, my relationship with God grew in that moment that it's hard for me to describe that surprised me that I did put him first. And in that way, I associate a little bit. I mean, nowhere near the Hall of Fame, let me assure you. Jenny could straighten that out pretty quick. But, um, but it is about laying your Isaac down. And so as people get confused, what does that mean? Is this a churchy's language? What does that actually mean? We're going to look at that tonight. So I, I've eliminated, I've summarized... Uh, you know, I meet with men sometimes, and I love to, t to tell them about Abraham's life, but I'm not going to detail that in every slide like I've done in the past. What I'm just going to say is like what, what Steve said, is Abraham was a knucklehead. He, by grace alone, God chose this guy, and he said, get up and go, and he packed all the stuff up, and he went. And along the way, he stumbled, and he fell, and he saw God bless him when he deserved it, when he chose he let Lot chose the best, the best land, 
and, and because he trusted God, God blessed him when he, when, he, when he took a step forward. He also blessed him when he shouldn't have, when he lied about his wife being his sister. And he did it a couple of times. And um, he was just like us. And so I, I, th- I find encouraging that to men that I, that, I, that I talk to. I mean, I just think it's the best example about how God uses our, he blesses us in the good and the bad, and he loves knuckleheads. Uh, and so God asked Abraham to sacrifice. It culminates, starts in Genesis 12, the story of his life. It ends up in 22, 1 through 19. So this is what we're talking about tonight. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, who you know, um, basically, I'm going to move this back. It might be a little hot. Um, is uh, He, uh, he asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, and Isaac was the promised one, the one where all the descendants were going to come through. It, it made zero sense. Have you ever been there? God, what in the world are you up to? Surely this is not your plan. If ever that was the case, it was here, because God himself had promised verbally to Abraham. So he asked him to, to, to sacrifice his son, and he got up. That was in verse 2. He got up the next verse. He got up early the next morning, total and immediate surrender, I mean, that is a, that's a stud. That's a, that's, a, that's a biblical stud right there. But he's the same guy that was a knucklehead and faltered his whole life. And he, he began, he exercised his faith, like Steve said, all along his life and got to this point. We're not asking you to do this on the first day, on the first night you're a prodigal. Um, and he trusted that we will return. He raised his sword, but God rescues Isaac at the last possible moment. And... Um, uh, I love the painting. I just got back from the Hermitage, and I, and I tried to get it in there, and it didn't work last night. I was just running late. But I want, I'll, next time, if you stay around six more months, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the picture. But right across, from the, right across from the painting that I wanted to see, the Rembrandt's prodigal, was uh, Rembrandt's painting of, of Isaac sacrificing. And, and it's a great painting because, um, just FYI, this painting, he's looking to God in... in, in in Rembrandt's painting, he is coming down, and the angel is, gra- is grabbing the, the the knife out of his hand. It's a it's a very powerful painting, and um, so Abraham's life was imperfect but faithful. He he grew to trust God's provision f- fully. You need to understand this. God didn't look at people's his life and say, "Now there's my guy. That's a guy that I can trust." For whatever reason. He picked Abraham, and he said, I can take almost, I think God's saying, I can take any man, any man or woman in this room, and I can, if they'll trust me, I can grow their faith through their hardships and their trials and their victories. I can take any one of you and do this. And that's really the point of the story tonight. And um, when it comes to Matthew 10, 37 through 39, he says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who doesn't take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. If we go after earthly riches and power and fame and fortune and what we think is important, controlling behavior, but whoever loses his life, whoever loses his life for my sake and puts me first, and, 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 and considers his life less and my life everything's about, he will find it. And so uh, take heart. Abraham, uh, God grew Abraham in these, in these issues. So another principle here is he worked all things for good. He, he, w- he took all these issues and all, the, all these things in Abraham's life, he worked them for good, and he kept his promise. So God can work all things for good. He keeps his promises, and he blessed him with a great nation. And he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you've done this, because you have done what I ask you to do with Isaac, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring and all nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. And Israel stands today because of this. He, he keeps his promises. And um, his summary would be that, you know, this is just one of the things, this is uh, um, something I put together last time, and it's not anything new, but it's just a way I tried to summarize this, was that God knows, as I was thinking about this, God knows we might be obedient for a moment out of loyalty or reason, 
But unswerving obedience and commitment, I believe, can only be born and maintained out of a loving, intimate relationship. Abraham did what he did because he knew God intimately. He knew he was loved. He knew God could be trusted. And that's why he did it. And that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. It's the only possible way. So, um, and so what was God's opinion of this obedience? He blessed him, but he also said, like, like you're thinking, um, you know, why did Abraham do it? What was Abraham thinking? You know, he could trust God, but did you ever think, how's God going to get me out of this? Um, we get a, the author of Hebrews, uh, and if it's written and inspired by God, we, we, we figure out what happened. He says in Hebrews 11, 8, 17 through 20, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And he who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. So Abraham had total faith in God. So what does God, what does this look like? Let's switch real quick here. What does it look like for us to lay our Isaac down? I've had people say, you, you use that term. What does that actually look like? So I tried to, I added a few slides. This is a new slide. So I was just trying to think about what does it actually look like? You're at the end of your, some of your end at your, of your second or third journey through prodigal. And fine, it takes people a long time. Uh, there's not, I don't know and the prodigal chaos is ongoing. So you're welcome here to go through as many times as you'd like. But if you're coming up and you've been through this curriculum cycle and you're coming up to this crescendo kind of uh, uh, message, I think, is that you take everything you've learned. What does it talk about laying your Isaac down? You obediently follow God's command regarding our prodigals. Abraham obediently followed God's command to, to walk up that hill on Mount Moriah and sacrifice Isaac. So if we're following God's commands returning our prodigals, we're laying our Isaac down. For example, Galatians 6, we let them reap what they sow. Proverbs 19, 18, 19. Discipline your son, and that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. A hot-tempered man must pay the penalty, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. You believe that. You do it. And God says, he's trusting in me. He's... he's He's following me. He's laying his Isaac down. He's trusting that what I've written, and it says, if you pamper a servant from youth, he will bring grief in the end. A servant can't be corrected by mere words. Although he understands, he won't, he, he won't do it. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your un, under, own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll make your path straight. 1 John 3, 18, don't, my dear children, do not worship with words or tongue, but in action and in truth. If you start to, to act on your faith, if you trust on him and lean on him, if you, if you believe that, that, I mean, he's written everything you need to know to, to manage a prodigal. It's all in there. And these are, just, these are just some of the cornerstones. You take the 20-week curriculum and you say, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to act in anger. I'm going to let truth determine my emotions, not emotions determine my truth. I'm going to forgive. I'm rich. I'm blessed. I'm a child of the king. I'm going to be unoffendable. Okay? God says, you're laying your Isaac down. You're, you're putting me on the top. And if you put me on the top, you're going to be a better father. You're going to be a better husband, wife, sister, brother, mother, father. You're going to be all of that. That's laying your Isaac down every single day. It's trusting, in summary, it's trusting God with the outcome of our prodigals. We're, we're, not, in, we're not in charge. We, we can't control the outcome. If you think you can, you're just newsflash. Never going to work. You got no control. Um, so, so how do we do that? How do we do all those things? The whole curriculum is built to do that. And you can lay them now, not on one fell swoop on Mount Moriah or not at a time where, you're, where your um, child's life's on the line and he's threatening suicide, but every single day as you, as you do all those things, as you, as you, as you practice prayer, if, as you realize that the suffering you're going through is only temporary and this world is not our home. 
Those, those are the things that you do, and it, and, it, and it blesses God, and it grows your relationship with him. And as you exercise your faith in doing that and seeing that work, just like I saw it work with my son, I'm exercising my faith, as Steve said. We, we, we don't just know the plays God has told us in the Bible. We run those plays. And when we run those plays and they work, we want to run them again. And we're, we're, welcome, we're, we're no more willing to run the other plays. We start to know him. We have a relationship with him. We know this is hard. This is the hardest thing that, that I'm not asking you to do it. I'm just telling you what God is telling you to do it, and, and then what, what we have done uh, by his grace. And you learn through his word, community, prayer, and you're transformed by those hardships and, um, and, and, and what I call those Ebenezers, those times where, you know, if you've got a journal, you know, I mean, you know what Ebenezers are, right? Many of you do. It, it's, it's where when, when, the, when Israel would, would take ground and God would bless them over an enemy, if they would lead into the promised land and they got to a place that they'd been promised and they finally got there, they stopped and they built these rocks up. And those are Ebenezers, right? Those are Ebenezers. Those are remembrances. Don't ever forget what he's done. So I would tell you that have a journal and every time he shows up, go and write it down and say, this happened to me and I exercised my faith and God showed up and I didn't see it happen, but, but two years later, this is how it all played out and I see it clearly now. If you do that enough, you'll stop thinking it was a coincidence because it happens all the time. It really does. So that's exercising your faith. And you begin to know him and trust him because stack up Ebenezers around you. Tell people around you, encourage them with the Ebenezers in your life. And they can see him working. That, that's, that's, what, that's what we should be doing back in our closed groups. Not just telling you about the word of the prayer, but how is he working in my life? This is what he did in my life. And then we can trust an unknown future to a known God. And I found out this week that Jenny plagiarized that from Corey Ten Boone. So, uh, uh, so if you have a lack of faith, if you don't do those things, life is tough. And everybody in this room knows that picture. 100% trust is 100% peace, and 99% trust is this picture right here, <laughs> eventually. And Because um, if we don't trust God with the problem, then we got to be the solution, and that is a burden that's tough. So I'm going to read a couple of things from that I think are really speak to this point that I think are powerful um, commentaries on this passage and on this issue of laying your Isaac down and really more of, of trusting God in faith. And they're Francis Chan and, and, and Keller, Tim Keller, and people that, are, that I really respect. And I want you to just listen to what they say. They say, worry implies that we don't quite trust that God's big enough powerful enough or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. Both worry and stress reek of arrogance. They declare our tendency to forget that we've been forgiven, that our lives here are brief, that we're headed to a place where we won't be lonely, afraid, or hurt ever again. And in the context of God's strength, our problems are small indeed. Um, and I just threw this in. Um, I don't put myself up there with them. So when I, I said I, I, I worked this in, I didn't mean to, to imply that I was on their level. But I just wanted to, to think as I've been struggling with how do we get people to, to lay their Isaac down and overcome it, which is the biggest challenge we face. Fear is our biggest uh, enemy. And, and I just want you to think about if we're paralyzed by fear in regard to the outcome of your prodigal's life, you're just never going to be able to stop enabling. If, if, if you have fear it's always going to handcuff you. And it's hard to overcome that. We totally understand it. I, f I fight it every day. We're not holier than thou. We're in the same boat with you. But if we live fearfully, we're in trouble. We'll never be able to stop enabling and allow God to work in the life of your prodigal you're going to get in the way. And you'll also hamper the true potential of your own relationship with God in the process. As you reach out and trust him, I will guarantee you when you've, when you've done those things and you reach out and you trust him, uh, think about your worship that week when you go on Sunday, the, the, the vitality of it, the energy of it, the, the relationship. It's, it's just, it's richer. It's wonderful. And so, um, 
for those of you that don't know Oswald Chambers, if I read this to you, you will never read him in your life if you read this one. Um, but if you know his heart and his, I just love people who, I guess it's the surgeon in me who loves that quote by Francis Chan, who loves this quote by Oswald Chambers because he just says, life's too short for me to pussyfoot around and sugarcoat this. I'm just going to tell you the truth. And if, if this isn't biblical, then I'll take it off. But John 3.30, he bases, and I don't know how Oswald does this, but in that one verse, he must increase, I must decrease, he gets this passage, and I'm going to read it to you. It's a harsh one, but there's truth in it. If you become a necessity to someone else's life, you're out of God's will. You could stop right there, but we're going to go on. As a servant, your primary responsible is to be a friend of the bridegroom a friend of Jesus. When you see a person who's close to grasping the claims of Jesus Christ, you know that your influence has been used in the right direction. And when you begin to see that person in the middle of a difficult and painful struggle, don't try to prevent it, but pray that his difficulty will grow even 10 times stronger until no power on earth or in hell could hold him away from Jesus Christ. Over and over again, we become, we try to become amateur providences or Amateur gods in someone's life. We're all guilty of that at some times, trying to save them of their pain. We're indeed amateurs coming in and actually preventing God's will and saying, this person should not have to experience this difficulty. It's not fair. Instead of being friends of the bridegroom, our sympathy gets in the way. One day that person will say to us, you're a thief. You stole my desire to follow Jesus. And because of you, I lost sight of him. I just argue that isn't that what would have happened if the prodigal son, the prodigal father, would have sent the son a thousand bucks and some filet mignons? Would he have come home? I don't know. I don't think so. Listen intently with your entire being until you hear the bridegroom's voice in the life of another person and never give any thought to what devastation, difficulties, or sickness it will bring. Just rejoice with godly excitement that his voice has been heard. You may often have to watch Jesus Christ wreck a life before he saves it. My only, my only thought there was that Satan wrecks lives. Jesus saves it, in my opinion. But there's truth in there that you don't want to get in the way. When we get in the way of pain, is what he's saying, is, is when we rescue our kids, they, don't, um, they just don't experience that consequence that might lead them home, might lead them away from the pigs, might lead them back to the fatted calf and the celebration. So what do you gain? There's a ton of things you gain. I'm just going to summarize a couple of things that are, the, to me, the, the best part of laying your Isaac down is that you're fulfilling your personal mission statement and your God-given purpose. And our purpose is to glorify God in all things. And when you put God first, when you lay your, your when you give your child, when you give, when you lay your Isaac down, you put, fill in, lay your idols down. Lay anything down at the foot of the cross and say, this is not important. The world says, my car, my house, my power, my money, my, my, my financial security in the bank are, are, are things I just can't give up. When you lay those down, you're glorifying God and saying, you love me. You number the hairs on my head. You, you, you know who I am and you'll protect me. And then the rest of the thing is that you prepare yourself for the rest of your life. I argue that if you can lay your Isaac down, that, that this won't, your prodigal will not be the last idol you have to lay down. And when you can lay down, I would argue that your prodigal may be the hardest thing. I think you could argue that if you laid your own life down, it's easier than laying your prodigals down in many regards. I mean, our kids are so, our, our, our spouses are so hard. I don't know. We could debate that, but it's close. I think it's emotional. And so if you can do that, you're bulletproof when you walk out these doors. Because if you can do that, the world's going to go, how do you do that? I want, and, and you can go out there and glorify him. You, if you can lay your idol down, and you, you can only do that by knowing God's good, and he died for us, and he was resurrected, and his, his, his word is true, and you can trust him. And if you can do that, then death has no victory, and death has no sting. And if you can beat that then the world's going to want to know who you are and what you're about and who is this God you serve. And that's what we're supposed to be about. So you're going to prepare yourself for the rest of your life. Don't miss this opportunity. So why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Uh, 
He forced him to choose, just like he forced me to choose in that moment, that, that I would choose God, and it changed my life. I'm not going to read that, but, but, um, um, but it's in your handout there. And so uh, Keller sums it up, and he said, God's extremely rough treatment of Abraham was actually merciful. Isaac was a wonderful gift to Abraham, but he, he was not safe to have and hold until Abraham was willing to put God first. As long as Abraham never had to choose between his son and obedience to God, he couldn't see that his love was becoming idolatrous. So Abraham took that journey, and after that, could Abraham love Isaac well and wisely? Only after that could Abraham love Isaac well and wisely. If Isaac had become the main hope and joy of Abraham's life, it's getting a little close to home here, I know, his father would have either over-disciplined him because he needed his son to be perfect, or he would have under-disciplined him because he couldn't bear his son's displeasure, or both. He would have overindulged him, but also become overly angry and cruel, perhaps even violent when his son disappointed him. Why? Because idols enslave. Isaac's love and success would have become Abraham's only identity and joy. He would have become inordinately angry, anxious, depressed if Isaac ever failed to obey and love him, and fail he would have since no child can bear the full weight of godhood. There's power in that, right? And, and um, so why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Because God needed Abraham to know that the man who would be the father of a great nation would have no hindrances with idols, and that proved to be the case. And I've said this before, anyone who loves his father and mother and me uh, it bears repeating. So why does God, as we close, why does God ask us to lay our prodigals down? I believe you have no idea what God has in store for you. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think any of us have a clue. Um, I think that it tells us there's a race marked out for us. In Hebrews 1, Hebrews 12, 1, and in Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 2, 10. We have a race marked out for us. And he, needs, he has a plan for us. And I believe he needs us to know that we've got no hindrances. And we put him first. And he needs us to realize that so that we can go take the hill for him. And we can lead as he intended. We can manage our money well, our family well. Because ultimately, for newcomers, um, you know, spoiler alert, but this journey's about you. I mean, do you see your prodigal here tonight? They're not here. The only ones here is you. And by doing these things, remember what Keller said, by doing these things, he was only then able to parent well. The world says if you, um, you know, tells the world, tells women to submit to their husbands, but they leave out the verse about that, that you, your husband should give himself to his wife as, as, God, as Christ gave him, to the church. He died for us. Um, the point is, if we put him first, if you die to, die to your wife, if you, if you put Christ first, you'll be, the, you'll be the most amazing husband that's ever lived. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better father. It's not, it's not of putting God and, and, and your family come second. It's, it's putting him first. So what if this is about you? This is about you... And I would say if you walk through those doors tonight, please stay through newcomers to let us explain this. But you, most of us come to change our circumstances. How do I get peace in the midst of this chaos? How do I solve my problem? How do I bring this thing to an end? How do I get my life back the way it was before? Well, the way it was before was an enabler who didn't trust God. That's how it was before. Don't fool yourself. So you come to change your circumstance, but God says, no, I got something better. I want to change you. And if I change you, then it might change your circumstances, but your life will never be the same. I'm going to tell you who I am. You can have greater trust in me, greater faith in me, greater relationship with me, and it, you're going to glorify me, and then it won't matter. Your circumstances won't matter. You'll be in a, it, it's a crazy thing. Not only will your circumstances not matter, I mean, they'll matter, but they won't bring you joy. You'll have joy as your identity in Christ, not as your identity as the son of a star athlete or the son of a successful husband. That won't be your identity. Your identity will be in a child of the king who's loved by the creator, and you're bulletproof at that point. You've got nothing more you need. 
And, and that's how you could leave here. And if you can figure that out, um, you're golden because it was good for you to be afflicted as you might learn their decrees. And God wants actions. He doesn't want words. Like, like John 3.18 said, uh, they're all here, not words or tongue, but action and in truth. But the hardest part here is what, is what if he doesn't, what if there's not a ram in the thicket? What if we've had two or three uh, suicides in prodigal, uh, one that I was involved with um, in a funeral service. I never thought that would happen to me. So we're not going to sugarcoat anything. I don't know what the outcome is. What if he doesn't give them back? If you truly give your prodigal to God, is it, your, is it concern to you what he actually does with them? Do you really believe that you have the means to change the outcome of a human being's life? Um, you know, we talked about this before. You know, could I do more? Could I have done this? And I, Hugh sent me an a, a email today that I read, and he said, if you're worried about that as a parent, when your child gives up the faith, and you say, what could I have done more? Could it have been that private school, military school, um, uh, a camp I didn't send them to? He said, think about Judas. I mean, Judas had the best modeling. He was modeled by God. He heard the words of God. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He saw him feed the 5,000. He saw him raise Lazarus. You think you could have done more than that? So if, if whatever he does with a person is not up to you, is your relationship with God enough? The elder brother had been serving the father his whole life, and he got upset when his brother found God when he came home. So was he really working for God, or was he working for what God could give him? And that's, the point of, that's one of the points of that story. So is God enough? Uh, if he doesn't give them to you, when you can get to a point where no matter what the circumstances is, even your worst nightmare, when there's not a ram in the thicket, and you can trust him in that, then you can do anything. So is that too much to ask? Let me read you something. Hebrews 11 is the Faith Hall of Fame. It says all these people, he's just named David and Abraham, and Enoch. He just goes down this hall of fame of these just giants of the faith. Not perfect. Not perfect. All sinners. I don't know about Enoch. He got, he got taken up kind of late. But the point is, is that, is that they were all sinners. They weren't perfect, but they were in the hall of fame. And he says all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things that were promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return, but instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he's prepared a city for them. They were still living by faith when they died, and they did not receive the things promised. He's good. He's enough. So I'll close with Oswald. Not often, but every once in a while, where you stand today, at the point of where you, you know you need to... I had a couple of leaders tell me today, I've got two people in my group. They're the best people in the world, and they just can't get over this hump. They just can't lay their Isaac down. So you're at that precipice. And if you're not ready now, keep coming. But if you're at this point where every once in a while God brings us to a major turning point, a great crossroads in our life, from that point we either go toward a more and more slow, lazy, useless Christian life or we become more and more on fire, giving our utmost for his highest and our best for his glory. Lord, I thank you for um, giving insight to one of the most difficult things uh, you'll ever ask of us, to put ourselves less and put you first. We like being on top. We like being on the throne. We like being on, in control. Um, and it's not even a bad heart. We love our prodigals. We want to do the right thing. We just get confused. We just don't trust that you're out there. 
We just don't trust that you, you know us well enough. We don't trust that you know our prodigals well enough, and we ask forgiveness for that. Lord, just open our eyes because all the lectures in the world and all the, the urgings and pleadings and passionate words won't change you. It's the Holy Spirit. So I ask your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of the people in this room to take, that need to take that next step to give their prodigal a chance to come home, but really to get their lives back, to lead in a way that would bring you glory and make them realize they're a child of the king and you're a God that can be trusted. There's freedom there. And I pray that for everyone in this room. In Christ's name we pray, amen.